Oh, welcome everybody to season two of Actual Disruption. New year, uh, new season. We're happy to be back. Um, today we are going to be talking about how to take a otherwise good website to the next level. Uh, just a little, a little uh, PSA here. We did have a little problem with the registration link. I'll Ben, I'll, I'll blame this one on you, and you can explain it. But we are going to be recording this, or we are recording it. Um, this will uh, qualify for one CAE credit, and I will be sending out uh, email confirmations and uh, certificates afterwards to all of our attendees. But um, the format for anybody who hasn't been here before is this is uh, we try to keep it pretty casual, but uh, we also like to, uh, to have fun and have a nice discussion with, uh, with just the three of us. And um, we love to hear what people think. So we're going to ask that if you're willing to, you know, throw some comments in the chat. We'll ask some questions where we'd love to get some feedback. So I'll let Ben talk about kind of how we started this and uh, we'll kick it off from there. So I'm going to start out by saying, actually, we are going to require a little bit more interaction this time than we usually do, because if you don't have a website, please leave the webinar because this doesn't apply to you. I'll wait. Okay. Everybody's got a website. We know. So everyone can relate to this at some level. So please get involved. But this is exactly um, how this webinar started is the three of us, uh, our firms have, have always had a good relationship and we were on a a call trading notes on a customer and it was early on in the pandemic and um, we were kind of making fun of disruption and the fact that, you know, we used to throw that term around many years ago, like, dis you know, disruptive technologies and disruption. And uh, one of us said, and I want to give Joe credit, but I won't because I'm not 100% sure it was him. But um, someone said like, this is actual disruption, what's happening right now. And we, ate, we had such a great conversation about the landscape and what our clients were doing to pivot. And it's, it's turned into not just during a pandemic, but how businesses have changed in, in this webinar series and the concept of this will sustain. And uh, we had such a great conversation that at the end of it, we said, gosh, that was such a fun conversation. We should do that in front of other people, I think. Um, so uh, we have a, a really good registration level today and we're really happy to be able to share a conversation that uh, we actually did prep for this time as opposed to the first time. We had it on the fly and didn't record it. We put a little effort into making sure that we hit some topics that hopefully you guys will find very useful. And if you wouldn't mind, there are many, many Ben Muscolinos in the uh, attendee list. So if you wouldn't mind changing your name to your actual name, um, but Ben had a little little slip up and sent the wrong link. So it's a little tough to see, <laughs> see who's I doing sent a, an admin link out to, uh, to everybody. So we got, we got lots of Ben Muscolino. So if you wouldn't <laughs> mind, we'd appreciate it. Um, so and just kind of kick us to meet Sherry because she was in the, uh, the, uh, presenter lounge with us earlier. Right. So topics for today, we're going to talk about what a good website means in, uh, in 2021. Uh, and how do you get to a good website? And you know, Joe will talk about this. There's nothing wrong with a good website, but really we're, we're gonna kind of close this out with how do you take good, turn it into great? How do you take it to the next level? So we'll start with a couple of quick introductions. I'll let Ben go first. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Muscolino, CEO of Breezio. We are uh, one of the leaders in online community and the leader in live engagement for uh, community engagement within the association nonprofit market. And I'm Jake Tuohy. I'm senior digital consultant at Adage. Um, we are a web design and development firm in uh, Chicago. And uh, this topic is really in our wheelhouse. Uh, and I'll let Joe talk about kind of some more of our services after, after he introduces himself. But um, yeah, we're excited to talk about uh, you know, something that's kind of right up our alley today. All right. Thanks, Jake. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Post. I am the Vice President of Strategy and User Experience Design at Adage. Uh, Adage provides our clients strong uh, vision for digital transformation, and we're really specialized in tight integrations and e-commerce. And that's about all I'll say on that topic for now, and I think we can keep going here, Jake. Yep. So uh, we have a quick poll, or uh, we'll ask for some, some comments in the chat, but we just want to know, just get an idea, what's What's the best website in your opinion? What's the best website in the internet? We like to uh, just get people's thoughts and uh, I'll ask Joe if he can monitor the chat and comment on anything that sounds interesting, but this is kind of what we're talking about today. So we'll give everybody uh, about 15 more seconds to, uh, to think about that and then we'll keep it moving, but feel free to drop your, uh, your thoughts into the chat. Got one comment already here, Jake. I appreciate Jake. the Reddit. Reddit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got a, 
another thumbs up on Reddit. Fun and time. Amazon, another Reddit guy. Maybe I need to get on the Reddit bandwagon. I haven't really done Reddit. Well, we're going to, uh, to kind of talk about the foundational elements of what a great website or what a great web experience is. We're talking data and analytics, being agile, iterating, uh, performance and scalability, and then finally kind of the connected experiences that, uh, that you're going to create. And I'll let Joe talk a little bit about that and how omnichannel extends beyond the web. Absolutely. So, you know, when we were thinking through uh, this webinar, one of the things that occurred to me now is that the, the nomenclature is important. You know, website used to mean something pretty specific, but now when we talk about websites, it, we have to consider what does that mean? Uh, for most associations in particular, you're going to have multiple platforms. You're going to have your, your kind of marketing or corporate site. You're going to have an e-commerce platform, probably. You're going to have your AMS. Some, some will have a, a social or community like Brizio. So really what we're talking about is, is well beyond just that single, that single channel. And so when we start to consider what makes a great website, we're really thinking about what makes a great set of connected experiences across those platforms. And that's how we came uh, upon these kind of important pillars here, data and analytics, performance and scale, uh, connected experiences, and then you know, the, the agile mindset. It's also a really important aspect of creating great digital experiences. Anything to add, Ben? No, not really to this slide. I'm good. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, before we get into kind of what, what a good website is in 2021, and I'll let Joe expand on this a little bit more, but we wanted to be clear that, you know, a, a good website is fine. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with having a good website. We're talking about, you know, boosting to the next level, but we want that to be very clear that, you know, good is, is good. So Joe, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I think good is good. Like Jake said, we build a lot of good websites. We also build great websites. So, you know, when we're talking about good websites, it's really just, uh, for me, a, a question of matching the digital platforms to your specific needs. Not everyone needs to have a great website. And when we're talking about great websites, keep in mind, we're thinking about really connecting those experiences, fully integrated data. You know, not everyone has those requirements. So for some, a good website is is you know, good enough. So before we kind of talk about what a good website is, we, we wanted to touch on what the absolute baseline has to be. Um, so there's a couple things that come to mind and mobile first design is absolutely one of them. Um, the search box and navigation is another thing. So you have to have a good navigation. You have to have good search. You have to have search, some kind of search. You know, you got to have the search box and it's got to be able to uh, allow people to find content they're looking for. And then finally, the intuitive user experience is absolute baseline from our perspective. So I'll let my co-hosts talk a little bit more about that. But these are kind of just the baseline that we talk about for any, you know, smaller site. If you're just getting started. These are the things you have to consider and make sure that you uh, you have as part of your site. Absolutely, Jake. So, you know, just starting with that search box and navigation, you know, baseline today is users expect to be able to go to your site and click into that search box to quickly locate what they're looking for. For the sites uh, that we manage, which at this point is over 100 sites, uh, we have access to Google Analytics and can see some trends. And on many of those sites, the first interaction on the site is going to be that search box. So, you know, if you're thinking about half your audience, first thing they do when they hit your website is going to go to that search box really important to have that functionality in place. The, the second point is this intuitive user experience, which, you know, throughout this webinar, we'll, we'll kind of conflate user experience and, and brand. And there's some really good reasons for that. But without uh, giving away too much right now, the, the point of this is like, you really need to have a strong brand, really tight set of user experiences. And that's baseline, people expect it. And it's really important to consider it's it's more than just the front door to your business it's all the interactions all the kind of micro moments throughout your website that really add up to your brand and if you have pages that just aren't functioning or, or functionality that just isn't adequate that is going to reflect on your brand and finally mobile first you know i've been building websites for a long time and i probably built my first responsive site in 2009 so if you're not up to speed on responsive and mobile first you're, uh, you're, you're lagging them. So that's a really important key thing. And again, most people probably know that, but believe it or not, we still see sites that are not mobile friendly. 
Yeah, and I'll add to this. First of all, we had a question come up about federated search, um, which is, I think we'll touch on today. Um, so I'm really glad that Christopher asked that question to everyone. We'll certainly touch on that, but I just want to, you know, uh, mobile first is a funny one for me because just um, I saw a conversation happening uh, online amongst industry folks, and it was what's trending and you know what are what are things and first of all I, I appreciate the mindset instead of like we're just redoing everything what are little things the question really was posed and i'll paraphrase what are little things we could be doing to step up our game and i love that question because it's really what we're what we're talking about a little bit today uh and what prompted this but there were things that came up like uh you know being mobile responsive and some of these little things and i i put a little video out yesterday to promote the webinar that talked about the fact that we're going to talk about what's trending today and we're probably going to talk a little bit about what's trending that shouldn't be trending that you probably already should have done and mobile responsive really is one of those things it's 2021 if you don't have a mobile responsive site don't worry about going back and redoing everything that you're doing you need to get there right there are some things that that you need to appreciate as a baseline uh with where we are in 2021. Now we've got a couple of questions I think we should try to answer. One is uh, about the mobile responsive idea in contrast to being mobile first as a mindset. Right. So I, I agree that those definitions are, are a little nuanced, um, but that said, I think mobile first is, is a little more than a mindset, it's also an approach. So when you're thinking about designing and building a site, it really means starting with the smallest screen size and kind of expanding from there. And there are associated or kind of adjacent concepts that go with that. For example, making sure that it's a kind of a progressive enhancement, if that makes sense to, to some of you, it, that talks about making sure that the functionality is not diminished uh, on mobile, but actually the mobile is really the focal point for the functionality and expanding that into desktop. So it used to be that people would really focus on the desktop. And then by the time they got to mobile, they were removing features and functionality because mobile devices couldn't support it or some other reason, maybe budget or priority. So when we're talking about mobile first, yes, it's a mindset. It's also an approach to thinking through how to create designs and, and building websites and applications that really prioritizes that experience on your phone. Part of the importance there too is that increasingly the audience is on the phone. I mean, if you think about how you spend your time after work, I'm gonna guess it's on your phone. So that's true for a lot of people now. And most of the sites that we monitor, mobile is increasingly the higher traffic source. So you're thinking more than half your audience is gonna be on that phone. It's really important to start with that device. There was another question in here that's a little different um, about federated search, which we will come back to. So uh, spoiler alert, we're gonna come back to federated search when we talk about great websites. So we're, we'll get there in a minute. I also appreciate Tobin's comment about the uh, the difference, one being technology and one being mindset. I think that's a really great way to paraphrase that too. Yeah. So to uh, to kind of expand on what what we just talked about, and we're talking about good websites in 2021. Uh, we want to talk about what what is included in a good website. We talked about baseline. So what is good? How do we get there? So we have a couple examples. We'd love to hear if anyone else has anything they'd like to drop in the chat. Um, what they think has to be included in a good website. But these are the things that uh, as we prepared this, we thought were the, were the most important. And that's the, the performance of the site, making sure that it, it's fast. Um, it's something that uh, we monitor and we'll have actually an offer to show you how you can uh, best enhance the performance of your site uh, at the end of this webinar, but uh, then faceted search. So being able to like a, a, a very good search is faceted, you know, think about Amazon. Um, that's the kind of functionality people expect in a good website. And then finally, single sign-on. So Joe, you can talk about this, but you know, often we'll see in the association industry, having links to different platforms uh, and having, having links is better than having no links, um, but uh, it's not quite the fully integrated experience, but I'll let you guys talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this is, you know, we're kind of talking about baseline good. And for some organizations, that's going to mean, you know, just having navigational links going to a different platform. You know, and, and a little better than that is having links that, you know, link you to a single sign-on uh, kind of application where you can go to a single login form, hit that button once and be logged into multiple platforms. So like, like we said earlier, if you're considering, you know, you have your kind of corporate site, 
you might have your, your community site. If you can be logged into all of those uh, applications and platforms from one login form, that's really a, a better experience. But that's just the baseline. Single sign-on and, and those integrations can, can go quite a lot further than that. Yeah, well, and I would add too, like, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into, we, we have customers that have and, and vendors that we integrate with that have differing opinions on some of that, right? And it's where where's the entry point or where do they update their profile? And you want to be intentional about, you know, are they able to log in natively here uh, on community or this third-party app or in the CMS? Or do you want to um, redirect them back to an AMS page? And sometimes it depends on what you're doing. We had a really good um a really good conversation with reggie over at ahima about where we put that login wall around your content too which which you know plays a a part in this but where do you sign in and what is the consistency of that sign on experience for what it is they're trying to do so you just want to be intentional uh about where you put that as well Absolutely. we had a question yeah we had a note from michael um that suggests uh, suggesting that basic needs are accessibility and good alt text, high contrast text, forms that work, et cetera. Uh, we are gonna touch upon uh, accessibility a little bit later, but uh, you guys have anything to, to comment on from, from Michael? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I think that uh, as far as like this concept of a pillar for a good, a good website, performance is that kind of bucket where we'd put you know, search engine optimization, uh, accessibility, uh, page speed, some of those considerations kind of fall into that, that bucket for us. But we, we do have in mind to talk a little bit more about accessibility at the, uh, at the end of the webinar. I would so, say it's funny though, when you take a look at what, uh, what he had posted in the comments, he forms that work, right? You would assume that all the time, right? But do uh, organizations um, task anyone with double checking that, you know, as we upgrade or enhance technology or over time, is there an automated way or at least a cadence at which they're making sure that their forms work like simple, um, simple details. So that's a really good point that I think a lot of people overlook. Um, so to QA is, is yeah. important you know, I, after you build and deliver, like you have to, you know, keep an eye on your stuff. I would add that there is a, also a great version of a form too. And one example I've seen recently is that uh, kind of progressive profiling model mm. where the website platform actually recognizes me and no longer forces me to give them my name and email address over and over. It actually welcomes me back. So that level of form is, is kind of in that great category, right? Where it's not asking me to repeatedly give the same information. So if we're going to move, uh, move into how do you get to good, we have a poll coming up uh, and I'll ask Ben to fire that up. But before we jump into how to get there, we wanted to ask if, you know, how do you consider, how does your organization consider digital or your website? Um, and do you think of it as a project or a product or, you know, a complete journey that, that lasts um, a number of different years? And Joe can talk a little bit more about what he means by that. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, Ben, throwing up the poll, and if we could ask the audience to answer, that would be great. Yeah, let's let's give them a second to answer the question, and then we'll we'll kind of dive into some of the, the definitions here and why this is important for a great and a good website. And what's no? We we're just going to allow them to say no, no. So you don't want to answer. <laughs> so if you don't want to answer, answer by saying no. So that's good. Okay. Given everybody, the people that want to opt out, that don't want to participate in webinars, too bad. You get to not participate by participating. <laughs> Welcome to actual disruption. Joe, Joe, talk about the product, like considering it as a product, though. Yeah. So, you know, this is kind of tied to that, uh, that kind of mindset question that someone had asked before, you know, and one of the things that we've seen for the more successful websites is that the mindset around the website is really shifting to think of it more as a product. And that is uh, consistent with the other comment I made about, you know, the, the user experience and the, and the kind of sum of user experience is your brand, right? So that experience adds up to what people think of your organization. So I like to think of that now as more of a product mindset. You know, if you're, if you're developing a product, you know that the, the performance of that product is a direct reflection on how well you'll perform in the in the market space. So for us, you know, we definitely think more product and more journey, 
which is to say that to have a really good or great website experience, it has to continually be improving. So we'll come back to some of those ideas in a minute, but this is, this is an interesting response from our audience here. Yeah. I've closed this down. I appreciate the honesty of the one person that just didn't want to participate and uh, voted no, uh, the out of context. No. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people agree and, and it's interesting. There's a good amount of people that, that selected product and I don't, you know, um, agree or disagree, but uh, we're, we're like, what's the place that they're coming from when they, when they answer in that way, you think, Joe? I don't know. I'm, I think it would be interesting to get some comments from the audience when sure. they, uh, when they describe that. Right. Yeah. And, and Ben, you had a note when we were talking about this, about how, how you approach or how, with the mindset to a website. Like if, if you're the kind of person that looks for plugins, you look to try to do it yourself or you contact your web vendor. That's, like that's true. two different things. So that's true. Well, right. And some people are kind of proactively looking for the best solution or uh, involving others. And sometimes it's budget, sometimes it's staff. I'm going to go, I'm going to stop sharing these results if that's okay here. Um, so we can keep moving, but yeah, I mean, depending on what your stable of vendors and partners looks like and consultants, your budget, your staff, um, there is this mindset of let's call our digital agency and involve them in this and pose that question and see what they suggest or what solutions they come up with. And do we build that right to, to us or do we pop in the, um, you know, the Episerver marketplace or, or um, what's the, the, correct me, Joe, what's the. What am I calling it now? It's not Episerver. The episode, oh, Optimizely. Optimizely, Optimizely thank yes. You. But that's, that's still a work in progress. It's a that's, whole separate. That's uh, another uh, webinar. Check yeah. Joe's blog. He'll, he'll explain <laughs> it, yeah. Um, but yeah, or do you go to the WordPress, you know, plugin store or the Salesforce App Exchange, right? Or do you go and try and find something that's built off the shelf and say, we need a directory. Hey, look at these directory options. Let's pull this in here. Or we need a directory. Let's talk with somebody about what we need. I, I think it's an interesting perspective. Because um, depending on your organization's resources and time and goals, that's, you know, neither one is, is um, right or wrong, but, but you want to be cognizant of, of what, you know, um, of which direction you're, you're, you're going with that. So right? we got a couple insightful comments here in the chat. So one, one person saying it's a journey, a user journey. I think that's, that's interesting. It is a journey and a user journey. And uh, those terminologies are, are fun because increasingly I'm seeing uh, consumer experience or uh, buyer journey or, or cart path. I mean, there's a lot of different names for similar ideas. Uh, the next comment is as a product, there are firm uh, return on investment ROI measures as opposed to a journey, which would be more difficult to quantify as I would perceive a journey. That's that's really an interesting point. And I think uh, spot on as far as that, that product thinking. That product, you know, if you think of like a startup mentality, it's all about measuring and improving and, and continuous iterations and enhancements. Uh, and the last, uh, the last comment in there is there's a, it's a place where they can, I guess they consume information. I think of it as a product and products and services can iterate. Journey is more of a constant process. So some good insight from our audience. Yeah. And Tobin also said they, I bet Episerver spent a lot of money on, on that new name and they probably did. And when they acquired Optimizely, I'm sure that was not a, a low ticket item. But to keep us kind of going here, we like to talk about like how what's the, what's the approach of the mindset for your organization with the with your website and if they consider it kind of a capital expense or an operating expense. You know, is it like a sunk cost or is it is it something that is important to them? Uh, and you look at it in the opex uh, frame of mind. So I'll let Joe talk about that a little bit more too. Yeah, absolutely. And some of these ideas are connected, of course, right? So you know, part of what we would uh, generally recommend is that. At a minimum, when thinking about a website a journey or product or however you think of it, also consider that to really be successful, there needs to be ongoing maintenance, support, care and feeding to continuously improve that experience and optimize those experiences. Sometimes that means just, just basic, you know, basic checks and making sure things are operating at their, at their best capacity. Other times it means uh, adding additional functionality and responding to you know, current conditions. And, you know, certainly during the pandemic, we've seen, you know, the more agile organizations really, you know, be able to pivot within their digital platforms and change their business models. 
And that's a really key part about the mindset of what is a, what is a website today? And we talked about the analogy of, you know, building a, building a building or building a house and then never cleaning the carpets or, you know, painting the walls, that kind of thing. I mean, absolutely. You would never invest in a new building and not invest in a cleaning crew. Well, it's, it's similar to other, I mean, as someone that's worked in the AMS space for a long time too, I mean, it's consistent, right? People come up with a budget and say, we're going to be able to afford this. And, and, you know, even if it's not a customizable system where you're going to be spending dev every year, let's assume you've got a very productized, even a down market system. Um, even so like training, right? Whether you're writing a check to the vendor or not, there's, there's continual improvement that needs to go in. It's like rolling out a community and not putting anyone in charge of it. Right. And we'll just give them a community to do what with, right? Do you have a community management strategy or strategy behind that? Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's gotta be um, a mindset around the willingness to continue to invest, whether it be time or money or um, uh, yeah. So what else is there? So to, uh, to kind of touch on something Joe just mentioned is, is agile being agile. And, you know, I think, if COVID taught us anything, it's, it's that you need to be agile. And, you know, we're, we're advocates of a minimum viable product approach. Um, you know, if the, if the market doesn't respond to your MVP, then you get a pivot. Pivot being the probably number one word of 2020, along with uh, you're on mute. <laughs> but, uh, but guys, talk about some examples of how, you know, an agile approach is so critical. I mean, we've had some clients do some pretty cool things uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, I'll let Joe and Ben talk a little bit more about those. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen we've seen quite a number of our our clients and partners really, you know, take the opportunity during the during the pandemic to try something new and try things that perhaps they never would have considered before. Uh, one of our client partners, you know, historically never would have allowed uh, online, you know, virtual proctoring of credit examinations, but in these conditions, they were, you know, quick to pivot to that. And we've seen a lot of other clients try other things. For example, we have one client who's really, um, ver uh, live events is really important for them. And they've really pivoted to providing a new membership model that allows uh, their, their patrons, their subscribers and members access to special online only virtual events of their, of their content. You know? And that's the kind of pivot that's really important to, to stay agile on. Uh I would, you know, it's, it's interesting when you talk about um, kind of this topic and, and going back to, you know, the conversation with Reggie, for me, like I was in love with that conversation. He did such a nice job, but, you know, we've had a lot of customers and we've had several that have had open communities for a long time, but kind of moving that login wall or, or rolling out non-member communities versus member communities and things like that. And it's interesting because like, that agile mentality allows people to not have to replatform to make other changes or test, you know, a new MVP or an approach or something like that in the market. And, and it's interesting having worked with small organizations all the way up to like four year projects in my career. Um, it, it's important to do planning around, uh, you know, building, you know, pouring the foundation and, and framing the house. But, um, but if you think it through all the, if you try to think two years ahead, um, by the time you get started executing uh, some of those requirements and needs will have changed. So being agile is one of the most important things we can do as fast as things move these days. Yeah. And the next thing we wanted to just have a discussion about, and these numbers are kind of arbitrary, but, um, just what separates a hundred thousand dollar website from a $500,000 website. And it could be anything from the platform, uh, like the CMS platform that you're using, uh, and then, you know, a ton of other different, different factors, but, um, guys, talk a little bit about this. You know, for me, I go, I go right back to what do you need your website to do for your audience and for your needs? And asking some really basic questions about what's actually required. And for some organizations, you require a digital experience platform, something really robust that allows you to do, for example, globalized content that's localized to your specific country and Maybe you have, you know, high information security requirements that require a very secure platform. For others, they don't have that requirement. So it just, you know, to me, that's where this conversation uh, really should start and end is what, what do you actually need? And too often I see, you know, 
people really biting off more than they can chew. And, and one of the baseline questions is how large is your team? If you have a one person marketing team, you probably don't need a half a million dollar website. Which yeah. kind of, uh, Tobin had an interesting question. Ben, I'll let you go after yeah, that. Yeah, you know, you're fine. Yeah, if, if uh, I think this is really interesting. Do folks have a web mission statement to articulate why they have a site? Joe, I think you probably have a pretty good answer for that. Absolutely. You know, and I mentioned up front that Adage helps our clients form really strong strategic visions. The way that we approach that is by creating uh, what we call an organizing idea, which becomes the kind of mantra for the, the project, you know, and, and it really helps align uh, both, you know, staff and membership and really get to the core of why we are doing this and who is it for. And usually those take the form of, you know, just a couple of keywords, but aligned with those keywords are some of our strategic goals, our user experience goals, our KPIs, and, and that really helps us drive successful projects. Really important to have a mission. Uh, I mean, a mission statement or a purpose statement, vision statement, a lot of different uh, names for that, but really key. And that thinking also really just comes down to managing change. And really, you know, the pro tip I'd give you is that to manage change, having a vision that people can get behind will go a really long way in making that a, a less frictionful process. Ben, you were about to talk and I cut you off. So I well, I just, I again, I, I try to like look at it a little simpler sometimes too, because people that it's depending on your budget and the type of budget that you have. Um, it's really interesting because a lot of it is the, the platform, right? I mean, you can spend $50,000 a year on a licensed um, and, and again, I don't want to, and I don't want to confuse, uh, cause otherwise Joe will, will call me out on this. I don't want to confuse a digital experience platform with a content management system with a blog, right? They're, they're all a little different. Um, and maybe we can go into that, um, separately, but you know, the idea of, you know, I can host what I need, um, over here for $5,000 a year versus I'm going to pay $50,000 a year for licensing to this platform over here. There are big deltas and, I would say that, you know, it's been really impressive to watch over the last eight years, six years, especially in all of these firms that, you know, every platform, whether it's open source or whether it's um, these other, um, like you guys had specialized in uh, Episerver for, for a long time. I know you guys do a lot of other things too, but um, you know, the reality is every one of these businesses in the markets has gotten smarter in terms of productizing things, things that they've built out in partnership with other organizations. And so the argument can be made for a WordPress shop that I can get a hundred thousand dollar website for 50 grand because they've got things that they're able to reuse and re-implement in different ways, whether it be code library or repository or the widget, you know, custom post types that they can re-implement and themes that they can manipulate. It's the same thing as you go up market, you know, um, and uh, t tell me if I'm wrong, guys, but like, you know, you can get sometimes a million dollar, a million and a half dollar project for six, 800,000, right? And it's like, it's not those, it's not the, it's not the direct number that I'm trying to relate to. It's that we've all gotten better in these individual markets. And so you have to think about that when you're talking to um, organizations that that uh, you want to deliver things for you and don't always um, set your goals with you, what you think your budget is and, and see, you know, everybody's got different strategies around what separates these. Um, and then yeah. also, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love this point because it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but the market is pretty confused and <laughs> there are so many terminologies thrown out there. And I think there's intentionally misleading uh, sales efforts, if you will, right? Where if you can conflate WordPress CMS with Epi's Digital Experience Cloud, I think that's very problematic. Those are totally different platforms that do very different things for very different audiences. And they're really not at all the same. And fundamentally, you know, for example, Epi DXP is more of a framework. And it's also a collection of other tools, right? So personalization and machine learning tools. WordPress doesn't have those, right? And that's where what the market has done is they'll say WordPress CMS plus WordPress VIP equals a DXP. And it's it's just really difficult to unpack that for a buyer. If you're if you're shopping and you're getting all this messaging that these are the same things, it can be very confusing very quickly. And the business models behind them are also 
very different and also very confusing. You're getting, you know, for example, product as a service, uh, very difficult to then unpack that from hosting and managed services. And all of those things are part of this environment now. It's making it very difficult to actually shop and compare these things. If you're mixing hosting with a CMS and then comparing that to an experience platform, pretty hard. Right. Tobin had a comment in here, apples versus oranges versus pineapple. I like that. And I like I that borrow too. it. It's like, I like sang sangria, it's like, right? Yeah. I'd like to say it's like comparing a car to like a combine tractor. You know, those are not at all the same idea. <laughs> but they're both motor vehicles. <laughs> they are both motor vehicles. <laughs> so I'm going to keep us moving here. Um, but, the, you know, the, the fact is that a great website means different things to different organizations. I think it comes down to uh, requirements and priorities. Um, so a lot of people want to go to Awesome Town, uh, but that's not necessarily in the cards for, for every organization. Right. So, and there's no silver bullet um, when it comes to your website. So I'll ask if you guys have anything to add to that before we go into the great section of well, this webinar. I think it evolves over time. Like it's interesting. I think about um, a number of things and just generally speaking in business, like incentivize the behavior that you want or build around your, your goals, right? And uh, what, like when I first showed up, uh, at the company a little over a year ago, like our website was just landing pages to generate leads. It's like, okay, like for us, that was a great website because it generated a bunch of leads. And we've made this decision that we want to provide more value to people that come to the website. And so we've started to evolve that over time. And yes, the landing pages are still there because, you know, our strategy around that hasn't changed, but our strategy as a whole, as a digital footprint has changed, um, we still want to generate leads, but we want to um, bring in different kinds of leads, which dic which dictates uh, the types of content that we put up, and um, and so it's yeah, it's ever changing. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, you know, and it really does have to just come back to what is the organization need and what is the audience they have need, and I, I think it always is a kind of a shift in mindset, you know. And if I think specifically about associations, one of the kind of legacies there is that the website used to just be for content, right? And in, in a sense, it becomes that that repository for all the content the organization generates but the question that needs to be asked i think is what is the utility of that for your audience or is that what they're looking for mm -hmm. well and this is a fun market to to get uh sold i think personally i'm i'm in love with this association tech market but um something romantic about the fact that we all kind of like know each other and yet there's a lot of competition that goes on i always like to argue that and this is this comes from like my mindset in AMS because uh, I've seen so many people say, well, just you know, like we want to change vendors, but just can you make it do what we were doing in our last system? And I feel like you know, starting with your goals in mind and working backwards is really fun because then you get to bring in uh, a lot of different people in this in this market that are willing to pitch you and say, this is how we want to help you get there. This is how we would get you there with this technology set. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Cool. So now we're going to be talking about kind of the third topic of the day is is upgrading to great and getting there and how do you get there and what what does great mean uh, in 2021? We do have our last poll and I'll ask Ben to uh, to set that up real quickly. Uh, but we are going to be asking about so when you budgeted for your website and Joe touched on this a little bit earlier, like, do you think about ongoing maintenance and support and enhancements? I mean, we, we used to say, you know, to maintain a site that you build, you're probably going to spend 20% of what the original build cost was. But I think more and more, especially if you're trying to get to the great, um, the great area, you're looking at probably spending, you know, closer to 50%. Um, so if you guys have anything else to add that while yeah, we, I think uh, we do the countdown, what I would, what I would submit on this topic, Jake, is, is that really, this is connected back to that CapEx OpEx question, right? And the, the idea here is that if you're investing incrementally, you can have, it would probably mean a higher OpEx spend, but probably either a longer lifespan for your website, uh, which means that you don't have that big CapEx spend, you know, every year but you have an increased OpEx spend. So that's, that's kind of the thought here is that the more successful websites, they're spending more regularly so that they don't have those huge expenditures to reestablish a platform. Yep. So Ben, you wanna do your, uh, your countdown real yeah, quick? Yeah, I'm gonna go five seconds, four, three. Do not trip running back to your computer to vote, but please vote. 
and we're going to shut this down. Let's go ahead and share these results. And, uh, you know, it's spread out uh, nicely. 43% um, of the people, um, 20 to 30%, and 38% uh, and 5 to 10%. And, and um, so what do, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about these results, Jake? Uh, well, I think 20 to 30% is kind of uh, what we've seen over the years, but you know, that, that can come back to the, the approach where it's, you know, set it and forget it and rebuild a site every five to seven years. Mm -hmm. um, but after a couple of years, you know, things get dated. You start looking at sites that were built five years ago. They don't look like the great websites that we were talking about, you know, as we kick this off. Right. Well, it's interesting too. Someone just posted a comment to us um, uh, and it was about, that their site is less complicated and they're able to manage a lot of the upkeep internally. And that's interesting because uh, there are five staff organizations that say that and 900 staff organizations that say that because managing it internally doesn't always mean that you haven't budgeted for it. Sometimes you're still spending, you know, $80,000 or whatever it is for, um, this, you know, give or take the market that you're in, right. Uh, for an internal resource to, um, to address some of those things. So, you know, you want to keep all that in mind. Sometimes it's not just writing checks to uh to a vendor so yeah and i think that that's a great point though um you know when we build sites we want to turn it over to our clients so that they can manage it successfully and do all the things that you know frankly like you, you don't want to pay us to do um but and then we want to build the new functionality and build the cool stuff so mm -hmm. uh, we like to come back and do that kind of stuff but always put the uh the management of the site, like the day-to-day -day into to our clients' hands so that they're you know, not spending money with us that they shouldn't be. And uh, when they do want to spend, they, they can do it on, on kind of the, the cool stuff that we're gonna get into and taking it to the next level. Unless Joe has anything else to add to that. Yeah, I would, I would just throw out there that um, I'm definitely seeing a trend around organizations who are kind of grappling with how to staff. And what I've seen is a lot more generalists uh, where you ask, for example, a front-end developer to also be your UX designer. And I think you can get a long way with that as far as kind of maintenance and support. But where that, to me, unravels a little bit is when you really need specialist uh, resources. And that's where, you know, an agency like Adage, I think, really is best suited, right? If you had a, a specific question about federated search or analytics, probably don't have those resources in-house, right? Or if you're really thinking about developing, you know, an enterprise-scale UX system, you know, a system of pattern libraries. Most front end developers don't, just don't have that expertise. So sometimes it's a question of, you know, how much generalization is, is appropriate. And sometimes you just need a specialist. So let's get into uh, to the taking it to the next level piece. Um, let me advance this here. Um, so it's the last section, uh, and this is what we're going to be uh, to rounding things out. So please leave uh, leave comments in and let us know what you think, because this is what's a great website in 2021. And we broke this down into kind of considering these four pillars of a great website. And the first one's faceted search. Um, so a great search across all platforms, using analytics, having a content strategy in place and optimizing that search. Uh, constantly, and then the consistency with branding and UX across platforms. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, about cross platforms. And I should mention also uh, when you're talking about great websites and and search experiences, things like Alexa, Siri, just voice search, which is uh, increasingly picking up picking up steam in the market these days. But um, then the last two, so fully integrating, you know, they're the you want to have SSO everywhere, but you know, there's things like the website should be able to recognize your behavior. And so say you received a credit or a certification, you know, a fully integrated ecosystem should be able to offer up content or products that are, are logical for kind of the next step in that user journey. And the last piece is uh, experimentation. So now you're talking about things like Optimizely um, with AI, machine learning, personalization, multivariate testing, you know, and wrapping all these things together. So guys, you got anything to add here? Well, it's a big undertaking for some organizations to think all the way through this. And it's interesting. Like, I think that if you start to compartmentalize it and take steps to improving it based on, you know, um, getting through this whole cycle, it's those little things like we have these two systems integrated, right? We've got our, I'll just make an example. Like we have our community or our LMS integrated with our AMS. Um, and yet that's not changing how our, you know, 
member experiences online and arguably with some of that data that we now have in our AMS, um, if we were to pass some of that with the login, um, that may change some of the things the, based on their activity or based on a certification or a micro credential or something like that. Uh, remember status or remember type or eligibility for something giving uh, power. And it's, you know, there are rabbit holes to go down for a lot of them, but um, if you compartmentalize them, you start moving through this to be, to be, you know, a sophisticated, really, um, really put together a digital experience uh, and a good website over time. Um, I think that uh, anyway, that's my thought. Cause I, I look at this as a small business and I'm like, that's a lot to take on, but we've started to peel them back one at a time and we've really stepped our game up and, and I'm, you know, I put myself in the same seat as, is uh, the associations, I think. Joe, you had a, when we were prepping for this, you, uh, you liked the LinkedIn example. Oh, so yeah. with, with yeah, integration think, and search. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, for a lot of, you know, people who do what we do, LinkedIn is, is kind of the social media channel of choice. So if you really think about what they've done, they've, uh, you know, acquired other companies, they've really expanded features and, and kind of value that way. But you can search for a job. Obviously, that's one of their core functions. You can search for people in kind of a member directory kind of format. You can also search for companies. You can search for content people are creating. So, you know, people publish posts and articles and things. You can search that. And it really interesting to me, you can also search into what used to be lynda.com became LinkedIn Learning. And you can search courses all in that one search box. So that's a, you know, kind of a great example of you know, here's a great platform, you know, you can, you can reach just about every corner of the application from that single search box. And what about search, like search utilities So you know, finding utilities, maybe is a better way to say it. Yeah. So this is a, uh, like a search box trend that I'm seeing increasingly now, which is that because the user expects that search box to be that first answer, you know, that first interaction with your site, I'm seeing a lot more sites put uh, kind of utility functions in the search. So for, for example, imagine going to your search box on your site and typing in login and having it take you to the login page or any other functionality like that, like change my address you might put in the search box. That's what the users are expecting now is that direct connection for, you know, what I'm looking for sometimes isn't content. It could be, I'm looking for a utility or a tool. And that, that to me is one of those, those areas that's like the future of the search box. Yeah. So um, just to kind of, you know, move, move further with this. We talked about um, this in a past webinar, but um, like the four pillars of a great website, this kind of gets wrapped up into, into this visual and I love my visuals. Um, but with all the platforms in the association digital universe, um, we, you know, we need to make sure that content from all of them is searchable. And that's, this is the federated search discussion. Um, but you know, also extremely importantly is branding consistently. Uh, I think in the association market, we see that is not necessarily a strong suit. So if you've got all these platforms, oftentimes we'll see that many of them look very, very different from, from the, uh, the actual brand. Um, and then obviously fully integrating all of these, uh, all of these platforms, like we had touched on a little bit more, but Joe, you have anything to add on the, uh, the brand consistency thing? So I think Absolutely. That's it's a, it's a huge concern. And it's, it's not just the, the, the logo, you know, and that, that often is a starting point, making sure the branding is consistent as far as the look and feel and brand expression, if you will, you know, colors and typography. Frequently across platforms, those are different, which for an end user, for your audience, that's going to equal a fragmented brand. I've even had in our user uh, research and discovery process, I've had members tell us, I didn't even know that platform was part of the organization, right? And it, even included the name of the org in the brand and they still couldn't recognize it as part of the organization. That's the sort of jarring experience to, to take a look out for. But there's also the consistency of user experience too and making sure that you're delivering at the level that is expected across the platform. So you know, one, one weak link in the chain is all it takes to start to fragment the brand and really diminish the user experience. And that's what it's all about, right? I mean, it, it putting the, the user at the center of the universe rather than traditionally like the AMS. Uh, ben, anything to add there? Um, you know, yeah, I think that people undervalue the, um, the importance of the brand consistency because I feel like putting the AMS at the center in a lot of cases is their way of saying, let's look at it from the member's perspective. We want one single login, right? And they create single sign-on and they write a little bit of data back to the AMS. 
And I feel like that's the good versus great when we're talking about websites, right? If we were to take a look at like the user experience across some of these things, um, that's the level up, right? You, you want a good sign-on experience, but I've worked with the organizations that, you know, are managed by an AMC that have, you know, a website, but then their AMS pages branded differently. Um, and then also branded differently than their online publication. And worse yet, they've got like separate domains uh, for a lot of them. And yet they've tried to put them all in one navigation and time all together. Um, so, you know, data and integration um, and that, that path and that journey and sharing data is, is, uh, is important. But, um, you know, when we're talking less about data and AMS, and let's assume we have some of that worked out, we're talking about websites today. And you have to make sure that you know, you, um, as maybe the proprietor of these things knows what you're looking at. Sometimes, um, it's like walking through your house in the dark, right? Like you can do it. If you have a neighbor over, they don't know where they're going. They're going to run into a wall. Right. So, um, you want to be really uh, mindful of making sure that that consistency is, is thought of in both directions. So we're making pretty good time here, but we have a bonus, very important topic. And this is really kind of in Joe's ballpark. Um, so I'll let him talk about this, but I think, you know, for me, it's, it's important to understand what accessibility means. I think we often see requirements say that the website's gotta be WCAG 2.0 compliant, right? Um, right. And I, I think the market needs to be educated a little bit about how extensive an effort that is. And I'll let Joe talk about that a little bit more because we do have you know, plenty of experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've uh, helped our clients uh, meet their requirements for accessibility, but it's a, it's a tough uh, concept to unpack. I think it's kind of similar to the noise around CMS and DXP, right? There's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of terminology and, and precision in wording is important. So often what I'll see is conflation, for example, of uh, section 508, which has to do with, for example, wheelchair accessibility to venues conflated with WCAG's uh, 2.0 uh, guidelines for how to make a website accessible. And we'll see that commonly in, in RFPs or RFIs, for example, people are saying, I want it to be both of those things, but not necessarily having enough information to really unpack what they're asking for. And accessibility, as we had said before, is really an important aspect of a good and a great website. And it has to do with, with performance and, and expanding what is possible in terms of your audience. And from our point of view, accessibility really is just the right thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, though, there's also a lot of pressure, I think, um, out there, you know, in our, in our world around, um, in effect, it's ambulance chasing. There's, there's, you know, attorneys out there who are, uh, you know, chasing organizations on accessibility. And there's a lot of uh, litigation out there happening around it. If you know, maybe there's another webinar on that, but it's really increased steeply in terms of the amount of lawsuits, and it's a really important topic. But if I go back to why it's important, it's important as a baseline because accessibility covers things like alt text, and alt text, if if you don't know, is effectively uh, an invisible caption to most users of your site. But it's a really important piece of accessibility information if you're navigating with, say, a screen reader which the screen reader will, will pick up on that description and it will re read it back to your end user. So for example, if you have difficulty seeing, you might be relying on that alt text to understand the content of the website. And that's just one example, but much of accessibility as it, as it relates to websites is really about front end uh, development. So for example, HTML and CSS code is really where a lot of those requirements are gonna live. So for example, the alt text piece, that's gonna be a front end developer who will, who will kind of set that up for you. But there's a lot of other considerations like color contrast, for example, where having the right amount of contrast is important to make the, the text readable. But there's a lot of other considerations. If you, if you were to take a look at the WCAG 2.0 or, or greater, because there's other versions of that out there now, you will see that there are hundreds of requirements. And that's the important part, I think, as far as like, if you're thinking about making your website accessible, really consider what you're asking because it will expand the scope dramatically for your website project. And it's literally hundreds of, of things you would have to check. And it really impacts the, the front end pretty heavily. But the part a lot of people don't also realize is that it also impacts your content development. So for example, you have to caption all your videos to, to meet all of the checkboxes. That's one of the requirements. For some people, that's not feasible. So 
there's that balance there of, of what are we really asking for against what do we really need? And while I think WCAG 2.0 to get to, you know, the AAA level is really, you know, it's an inspirational visionary thing to try to attempt for a lot of organizations, it's just not feasible. So finding that balance between, you know, what you're asking for and what we actually can do is an important uh, kind of step to consider. And like I mentioned, there's actually three different levels. There's A, double, and triple A, and the requirements increase with each. So again, this was more of a PSA just to, you know, kind of throw that out there. A great website is accessible, but there's a lot of considerations around it. One of those being having to be audited by a third party too. So that's another, you know, hat that gets thrown into the ring. So we have a couple minutes here left. I'll, uh, I'll just go one minute. Anything else that you guys thought of as we went along here? Any things to think about uh, as we wrap this up or if there's anything that uh, anybody's dropped in the chat that I may have missed, but um, anything else as we, before we get to our wrap up and the, the offer for our website? Um, Someone's saying talk about personalization. I'll, I'll mention this real quick um, just because I think that we we had a ton of really cool ideas when we were trying to figure out what's that divide between good and great when we were having a prep conversation on this. Things like rounding up donations and little things like that that we really didn't even touch on today. And like inventorying, like what are some of these innovative things that people are doing that doesn't require you to re-platform or do like massive things, but just to step your game up a little bit. Um, what are some of those other like little um, items uh, that people um, in, in like, you know, comparative yeah. to the, like the list that I saw online the other day where someone said like, you know, mobile, uh, mobile, you know, friendly, like if you're not doing that, just, you know, put your website to sleep. Um, what are personalization the things that Mike, people Michael, oh, sorry about that michael has to talk about personalization and, and yeah let's diff, talk about different levels let's do that real quick Fantastic. Yeah. So there's a uh, again this is where the the precision language is important because personalization has has evolved right it used to be that personalization was a really basic you know for example a salutation in an email you yeah know, if you the email address you by your name that used to be, you know, best best in class. But these days, personalization is well beyond that. And I would break that roughly into two major buckets. One is the more manual, you know, someone, a CMS editor creating content for specific audiences and kind of doing that manually. There's another bucket, which is more the machine learning algorithm-based uh, personalization, which requires a lot less manual intervention, still requires some, but that's, that's really where the kind of visionary future is headed, where more and more personalization is happening with the machine helping. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is that, uh, you know, people struggle with personalization because they realize it's a lot of work to, to do it manually. If you can imagine, you really have to understand your audience, you have to break it into segments, and then you have to create content. So say for, for a typical association, you might have, you know, 10 to 12 personas or segments that you're targeting, now imagine duplicating all your content for 12 different audiences, pretty tough to do. So that's where the machine learning part's coming in. And that is using, uh, for example, session-based or behavioral inputs. It will, for example, track what pages on the site you've reviewed and then give you a suggestion or a recommendation for a certain type of content that you might find interesting. That's the future. And that's the sort of uh, consideration, you know, when we're talking about the difference between a $100,000 website and a $500,000 website, WordPress doesn't offer that, right? If you want machine learning, you're looking at a, a digital experience platform like Optimize. So um, we're just a little bit over time as we are known to do, uh, but just to wrap up here real quickly, um, these are the things that we talked about. So the baseline, good, great. Um, and I think we've, we've talked through quite a bit of these. And if anybody would like this deck, uh, I'd be more than happy to share it. And you can ask me when I follow up with the certificate. But in the interest of time, uh, real quickly, we are going to, uh, we wanted to talk about things that we're planning on talking about um, in future actual disruption webinars. Um, and this, some of the ideas we had were e-commerce and your AMS using an e-commerce platform versus the functionality in the AMS. We're going to do an AI machine learning part two at some point. Um, we're going to talk about branding, and then we, we'd like to get into some leadership stuff as well. So before we go, um, we have a website assessment recommendation. I saw Joe drop the link if you would like to sign up on our website. But uh, real quickly, it's, it's really just kind of a you know, half an hour discussion about 
running report and then and then assessing your performance, accessibility, um, UX best practices, and SEO. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Joe, while I flip to our last slide the, so that everybody can get our contact information. If what I would add, get, Jake, is that I get a real kick out of doing those assessments. You do. Believe it or not, I enjoy that thoroughly. So if you want to sign up for a free assessment with me, I'm happy to do it. So any closing thoughts, Ben, I'll let you go first. No, I just, I love having a broad um, conversation about something that really relates to everybody um, and, and finding some narrow ways to, to talk about that and hopefully give some really good takeaways to everybody. So you guys uh, really bring a lot more value than I do to this conversation today. So I, I, I thought it was a great, uh, great webinar. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I will be in touch, um, but uh, we'll sign off for now. We'll hope to see you at the next episode of Actual Disruption. And uh, again, we thank you for, uh, for joining us and, and spending some time with us today. We hope you got something out of it. Take care, everyone.